Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. This is lecture number 36 in the book of Deuteronomy. We come today to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and we begin our study in verse 1. God is giving the Israelites some commands that cover <coughs> really every area of life in principle before they enter into the promised land. And he says, beginning in chapter 25, verse 5, If brothers are living together, and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. Now, a widow in Israel was not to marry a stranger if her dead husband had a brother or another close relative. Uh, but it began with the brother. It was his responsibility to marry his sister-in-law. And verse 6 tells us why. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. Their first son together was considered the son of the dead brother so that his family name would live on because inheritance rights and genealogies were very important in Israel. They kept very close records and they did not want a family to be totally eliminated um, because of a premature death. 7. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. God wanted the surviving brother to marry the widow. So to refuse was to refuse God's will. In that case, the issue was brought before the judges of the land to try to wake the fellow up, and if not, punish him. Because this is God's command. This is God's will. Verse 8. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her. Stop there for a second. First order of business for the judges was to confront the man with his rebellion. If he still refuses, well, verse 9, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders. Now, this was done in public. This widow, the last part of this verse says, should take off one of his sandals and spit in his face and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's line. This man ought to be ashamed to rebel against what he knew God wanted. Evidently, he wasn't ashamed. So the woman spit right in his face, right in public, right in front of the judges. Now, he may not be feeling shame for the right reason, but I guarantee you, he is feeling shame. And the point is, any rebellion against God ought to make us feel ashamed. If it doesn't, there's something wrong with us. 10. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. In other words, people were to never forget what this man refused to do. As his punishment, people would look down on him the rest of his life. 11. If two men are fighting, and the wife of one of them comes to rescue her husband from his assailant, and she reaches out and seizes him by his private parts, 
Now, it doesn't matter if the wife was trying to help her husband or not. That is going too far. She may be trying to help her husband. No doubt is. But the fact is, she could damage that man's reproductive uh, capabilities. And as we have seen in the law of the brother marrying the, the dead brother's widow, that was a very important thing in Israel. And so, you know, there are other ways for her to stop this guy from beating the tar out of her husband. She didn't have to go that route. But if she does, consequently, verse 12, you shall cut off her hand. Show her no pity. No excuses. Don't listen to her. No, well, you know, I was temporary, temporarily insane. It was just a knee-jerk reaction. I wasn't thinking. No. No pity. God says cut off her hand. I bet she didn't do it again. And the real purpose of such a strict penalty, I bet it deters others. I don't know if anybody ever did this because of the penalty being so harsh what it was. And that is the reason for God's just punishments when it comes to sins and crimes back in Israel. It wasn't to be mean. It wasn't to get revenge. It was justice. But it was also to keep it from happening in the first place, which would be a blessing for everyone. 13. We shift gears here a little bit. Do not have two differing weights in your bag, one heavy, one light. And this refers to business dealings. A businessman wasn't to have two different weights used for measuring how much he was selling or how much he was buying. In other words, what God is saying is this. Don't put your finger on the scale and charge someone for more than what they are getting. And don't purposely cheat someone by paying them less than what they think they are getting. 14. Do not have two differing, differing, differing measures in your house, one large and one small. Again, the point is do not cheat in business. When you sell, don't lead people to believe that they are getting more than what they really are getting. 15. You must have accurate and honest weights and measures so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. The Holy Land was a great place. And so the promise of a long life <clears throat> for the obedient was a good motivator. 16. For the Lord your God detests anyone who does these things anyone who deals dishonestly. You know, God doesn't just detest the sin. God is righteous. He detests the sinner. He is a righteous God. God loves righteousness. That's why He hates dishonesty of any kind. Corruption in business deals is a big deal to God. He hates it. 17. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. And if you were with us in the book of Exodus, then you might remember that shortly after Israel came out of Egyptian slavery, they were attacked mercilessly, attacked by Amalekites. And Amalek's attack on Israel was about as cruel as it can be and it was totally unprovoked and what made it even worse is that Israel had just come out of Egypt where they had been slaves for many years they were not fighters they were slaves they were innocent they were vulnerable they didn't, they didn't plan on hurting Amalek it didn't even come into their mind and so it was a terrible thing, and it gets even worse. Verse 18, it says, When you were weary 
and worn out, then met you on your journey, and cut off all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. Amalek's greatest evil, I think, in their whole attack, was that they purposely attacked the weak in Israel. They went after the stragglers, you know, the, the sick, the lame. And clearly, by doing that, they had no regard for, for God at all. I mean, everybody knew what God had done to Egypt on behalf of the Israelites. Everybody knew about the plagues. Amalek must have known, but they didn't care. No fear of God at all. They just attacked God's people. 19. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land he has given you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. God says, I want justice to be carried out against these people. They had no regard for God, and they showed it by mercilessly attacking God's people. So God tells Israel, that after they are settled in their new land, that they are to wipe out Amalek. God's justice shows no mercy to those who show no mercy. Chapter 26, verse 1. When you have entered the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, and have taken possession of it, and settled in it, well... <clears throat> God once again reminds them that that land that they are about to enter is a gift. They have not earned that land. It is being given to them by God. It is a gift. They are to remember that. And as a result, notice verse 2, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for His name. God doesn't say how much Israel is to give Him in this first fruit offering. He doesn't specify. That was left up to the generosity of the people. This was to be totally decided by them. However, they should remember that God has been very good to them and that all their produce had been given to them by God. And it's like us today. Whatever we give God already belongs to Him. He's just allowing us to give some back. I think we're going to stop right there for today and we'll begin our study in verse 3 next time. Until next time, Mike.